So it's one of those symbols up there. So uh, he puts the symbol on the shields and the banners of his troops and and he meets uh, Maxentius for battle. So 312 marks the conversion of Constantine. Mm -hmm. Which one? 312. 312. And so he goes out and he meets he meets Maxentius. Maxentius tries to escape in the river or falls in the river, not sure which, and he drowns. And so a few days later, they pull his bloated body out of the river. <laughs> They cut off his head, <laughs> and Constantine paraded it all over the western part of the empire mm -hmm. to let everybody know that he was the only Augustus in the area. <laughs> now, even though this marks the date of Constantine's conversion, this was a lifelong conversion. <laughs> He doesn't actually get baptized until about his deathbed. So then Constantine meets with Licinius in the east and tries to get a truce between the two. And so Constantine gives Licinius his, his half sister Constance in marriage to secure that relationship. And in, and in 313 is the most important date in the 4th century, and probably one of the most important dates in church history. This is the Edict of Milan. Because this is when finally Christianity was tolerated throughout the kingdom. Christianity is not the official religion and won't be for several decades after Constantine's death. But what, happens, but what happens is, remember, we had two lists that the Romans kept, licit religions and illicit religions. So Christianity is moved from the illicit to the licit group. Entonces tenemos dos grupos, o tenemos dos tiempos, o dos épocas, cuando los cristianos fueron parte de los ilícitos y ahora son ilícitos. Entonces, ilegal y ahora legal. And so, uh, also in the deal was that the Christians who lost all their property under Diocletian would receive their property back. Y toda la propiedad y terreno que tuvieron los cristianos que se perdieron por el tiempo de Diocleciano lo ha devuelto. But Maxi, Maximianus II, he's still pouting down there, and he still persecutes the Christians. Constantine was this guy of great pomp and luxury. He was either a narcissist or he thought he was a god, one or the other, I'm not sure. But he won the loyalty of the people because he, he did something that the other emperors couldn't do. He secured the borders from and Gaul from the barbarians. Pero él ganó como una fama de toda la gente porque él hizo algo que los otros emperadores no pudieran hacer y eso era para asegurar las fronteras del imperio romano. He captured their kings, he threw them in the circus, he paraded them through the streets. 
él captivó a muchos de los reyes de las diferentes fronteras y esa gente lo ha echado en el circo robando y, y también lo ha matado todo de ellos. He, he killed so many of them in the circus that people got bored with the shows. Lo ha matado tanto de ellos en el circo que la gente estaba abolido. And the historian says the beast just stopped killing. <laughs> but he had been planning this military campaign to take over for years. And so Licinius went out to meet Maximianus II to fight him in battle because he's causing all these problems. Licinius did. Mm -hmm. Entonces Lic Licinio se fue a, a Maximano para tener una batalla con él porque él estaba molestando todas las cosas. So then Constantine uses that opportunity to invade Licinius' territory. Entonces mm -hmm. mientras que Licinio <laughs> se fue a batalla con Maximiano, Constantino dice, bueno, voy a aprovechar. <laughs> and then during the battle with Maximianus, he, he flees and, and dies. No, Maxi, Maximianus the second dies. So now we have two leaders in the empire, one in the east and one in the west. Ahora tenemos dos, uno que está occidental y el otro en el oriente. But both of them wanted the whole thing. Pero los dos querían todo el imperio. And so they eventually declared war on one another. Entonces en el final había guerra. But there was a truce. Pero porque tenía tregua antes. But because now Constantine and Licinius are against each other, Licinius starts persecuting Christians. Entonces como Licinio y Constantino tenía tanto tensión, Licinio empezó a perseguir a los cristianos. So in 322, they met for war. Entonces en 322 es cuando hubo batalla. And Licinius feared the Christian God. Y Licinio todavía tenía miedo de Dios de los cristianos. He ordered his troops not to look at the Cairo. Entonces dijo a todos sus soldados no mira a Cairo. Do eh, not sí, look at the Cairo on the shield. Do not look at the Cairo on the banner. No mira eh, el escudo <laughs> ni la bandera de eh, el signo de Cairo. And Constantine met them with a much smaller army and he beat them. Y otra vez Constantino se fue a la batalla con un militar de pocos soldados, pero todavía ganó la batalla. So Constance came to her brother Constantine and, and pled for her husband's life. Entonces Constancia que estaba casado, todos son consta. Constancia and, que estaba casado con Lencinio dijo, por favor, estaba rogando para que no se mata a su marido. But while she was pleading for his life, somebody murdered Pero her husband. Pero mientras que ella estaba rogando por la vida de su marido, alguien mató a él. So now Constantine is the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Entonces Constantino ahora es el emperador único. And he ruled until his death in 337. Y él reinó hasta su muerte, que era en 337. And he remained the pagan high priest for the rest of his life. Pero en todo ese tiempo, él siguió como un sacerdote alta de dioses paganos. He never made Christianity the official religion of the empire. Y no hizo el cristianismo como la religión oficial. During his life, there was a lot of conspiracies against him. Y durante su vida había mucha conspiración contra de él. And he got wind of one of them who, and it was blamed on his son Christus. Y él escuchó de uno de eso y lo echaba la culpa por Crispo, que era su hijo. And Constantine executed his son. Y Constantino mató a su hijo. But he found out later uh, that his son was not really responsible. <laughs> and this tortured him. And, and so uh, a lot of the historians say as a sign of penance, he went all over the empire and, and built uh, Christian basilicas. We'll talk about that right now. We're getting right into that. So Constantine wanted to build 
he wanted to rebuild the glory of Rome. Constantino quería construir y también dar la vuelta de la gloria de Roma. And instead of uniting the empire through paganism, like everybody did before him, he wanted to unite the, Christ, uh, the empire through Christianity. Y incluso como todos los emperadores de antes siempre estaban intentando unir el imperio por paganismo, él quiso hacerlo por medio de cristianismo. Which is strange because Christianity at this time was only 5% of the Roman Empire. Pero eso fue un poco raro porque en esa época el cristianismo era solamente 5% de la And so he felt in order to rebuild the glory of Rome, he needed to build a new Rome. Pero él pensó que para tener la gloria de Roma, tuvo que construir una Roma nueva. And in the fashion of Constantine, he named the city Constantinople after himself, the city of Constantine. <laughs> the old Rome represented the old system. And, and, and Constantine was starting from scratch using Christianity as the basis for the new Rome. So this was in Byzantium. This was in Byzantium. This little red dot right here. And this was such a strategic location and that's why he picked it. Eso era un sitio de mucha estrategia. Because if the invaders invaded from here, they would have this checkpoint and they could fight them off. Entonces, si invadió por allí, había otro que tenía Roma. It is also the wealthiest part of the empire because of the trade with Asia Minor. Eso era eh, la ciudad más rica porque tenía mucho em, eh, em, empresas allí. And as you can see, it's also in the center of the kingdom. Y también se puede notar que estaba en el centro del imperio. Rome, I mean, here's the kingdom over here. Eso Rome's es, here, the Byzantine's here, it's more central. Eso es el reino total, pero eso estaba en el centro. So he wanted to build a new Rome there in Byzantine. Entonces, él quería construir una nueva Roma ahí. So he did this with, in, in true Constantine fashion, with a lot of pomp. And a lot of ceremony. It was a huge ordeal. And he marks off the new Rome. And then he gathers up these pagan gods from all over the Roman Empire. And he decorates the city with them in fountains and gardens. And, and so the pagan gods lost their power. Um, and then in the center of the city, there was a huge statue of Apollo. Pero en el centro de esa ciudad había una estatua de Apollo. It was 125 feet in the air. Mm -hmm. Era 125 pies. And Constantine removes Apollo's head. And he puts his own head on there. And he leaves and he leaves the uh, and he adds the Cairo symbol to it. But he leaves the other pagan symbology on the statue. And I think that's a good picture of Constantine, that statue. He was really trying to syncretize Christianity with paganism. So the city, it grew really quickly, very fast. Because construction started as soon as he as he declared uh, marked off the boundaries and they started building new Rome. <laughs> so uh, eventually the barbarians in a, in a, in you know in the fifth century the barbarians will invade the western half of the empire and take it over. And so, so then, 
the eastern side of the empire will hold their empire. Pero el, el parte del oeste, or el este, sí, iba a estar fijo en el imperio romano. And that will become known as the Byzantine Empire. Y eso sería mm -hmm. de Byzantina. So uh, the barbarians, I'm assuming, are from Germany? And uh, yes, all these northern areas. <laughs> because I'm not sure they're going to be happy in the fifth century to be called barbarians. Well, and they went to like France, what, which would be present day. Well, they, all of these territories up here. France and Spain. Basically, this is basically oh, no. all. They this, call it Gaul at any, time. Any, any place oh, above here, outside yeah. of this map, is. Because this is so the land of Christianity. Any invaders from those northern countries outside the Roman Empire. Uh, it's, that's when the Muslims invade and take over yeah. in, the, in the 8th century. So we'll, 8th century. Mm -hmm. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, but in, in the year 330, something very interesting happens. Under a new united Rome, For una Roma nueva unida, an emperor does something no other emperor has ever done before. He enters into the Haggai Sophia and, and participates in Mass. And this was the same time that he uh, dedicated the city. So he dedicates the city and goes to Mass. Constantino dedicó a la Nueva Roma y se fue a la misa. Uh, this was the first structure of Haggai Sophia. It had been, since then, it's been uh, rebuilt a couple times. Es fue la primera Haggai Sophia <laughs> estructura y desde ese momento ha sido construido varias veces. And the other main church in the city was the, the Haggai Irene. Y la otra iglesia era Haga Irene. So, Holy Wisdom and Holy Peace. Entonces, okay. eso es eh, la, la sabiduría santa y paz santa. But there's no doubt that the old Rome is still pagan-focused, mm -hmm. pagan-centered. Pero no hay dudas que la Roma antigua era centro, era paganismo. In fact, if you go to Rome and look at the Arch of Constantine, there's no, there's no Christian symbols on that at all. Si vas a Roma y ves el arco de Constantino, no hay símbolo cristiano. But in the new Rome, in Constantinople, this is Christian focus. Pero en la nueva Roma, en Constantinople, <laughs> eso es cristianismo. Now, Constantine wasn't always popular with Christians. He called himself the Bishop of Bishops. Constantino, Constantino no era muy popular. No era muy popular porque él le llamó a sí mismo el obispo de los obispos. And he also called himself the 13th apostle. Y también llamó a sí mismo un apóstol de 13 de los apóstoles. But no bishop dared to raise their voice against him. Pero no había obispo que levantó su voz contra él. Uh, I don't think that most Christians during this time period really considered Constantine a true Christian. You know, some people want to make Constantine out to be a saint and others want to make him out to be the Antichrist. <laughs> But the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, Constantine uh, had a sincere belief in the power of Jesus Christ. Constantino tenía una, una creencia sincera del poder de Cristo. It was kind of like, uh, almost like the faith of the uh, patriarchal fathers uh, in the Old Testament. Jesus was just the most powerful of the gods. Era parecido de cómo era la gente en el Antiguo Testamento, como Abraham y ellos, que ellos pensó que Jesucristo era poderoso, pero entre los demás dioses. And when Constantine did things that favored Christianity, he didn't do it for the Christians, he did it to appease God. Entonces, Constantino sí lo hizo cosas para placer a Dios. Now, anybody got any questions over that? 
pregunta de esto. Constantine's father, he worshipped the unconquered son. El padre de Constantino, que era Constancio, él adoró un dios que era el unconquered sol, son. el inconquistable sol. And so Constantine kind of begins to either syncretize or blend these two or starting it or has Christianity replace that. Father God kind of replaces that. Entonces, para Constantino era como esa Dios, era como Dios Padre. As if mente. somehow the unconquered son is Father God or something along those como lines. Como que esa Dios de inconquistable sol era como Dios Padre. If the pantheon of gods were real, but they weren't as powerful as God. Yeah. That's basically Constantine's standpoint. El panteón de dioses eran reales, pero no eran tan poderoso como el dios de cristianismo. Now, the majority of the empire is still pagan. Pagan means ruler, uh, rule or rustic. Pero la mayoría, out in the country. la may mayoría de el imperio todavía fueron pa paganos y la palabra pagano significa rural. Or a campesino. But slowly over his life, Constantine starts to loosen his grip on paganism and start tightening his grip on Christianity. Pero durante su vida está perdiendo el pa el de ser pagano y está como más y más cristiano. But he's walking a tightrope between two worlds and he's trying to unite the kingdom. Pero está como andando entre medio de ellos. So on the coins from his time period, on one side of the coin you might have pagan symbols, on the other side you might have a tightrope. Entonces, por la moneda de su época, había por un lado como la cabeza un signo cristiano y por el otro lado un signo de paganismo. But what he did is he started promoting Christians to high places in government and he started, uh, he started uh, giving them tax exemption just like the other pagan priests had. Empezó a nombrar cristianos a puestos importantes de gobierno y también ha dado a ellos como ayuda con los impuestos. And he did something for the first time for the church. They, he, he orders the first ecumenical council. Y hizo algo por la primera vez un concilio ecumenico. Now the church has met in council, council since Acts when, you know, the Jerusalem met in a council. But this was a worldwide council where bishops came from all over the world to meet and discuss doctrine. Y había concilios en otro sitio, pero eso era un concilio mundial, básicamente, para hablar de la doctrina. And this is known as the, and out of that came the, the Nicene Creed. This is the Council of Nicaea. Eso era el concilio niceno, que y viene el credo de ahí. We're going to talk about that later. Pero vamos a hablar de eso más adelante. But after his death, Pero de la de, the Roman Senate moved to declare him a god. And his three sons did not refuse. <laughs> so in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they declared him a saint <laughs> later on. En el este, en la iglesia ortodoxo este, ellos proclamó a él como un santo. So for the first time in history, we have a person who is both a pagan god and a saint. Entonces, por la primera vez en la historia, es un dios pagano y un santo. So, but this is where the Constantinian era or Christendom begins. Y eso es cuando cristianidad empieza. And Christian, uh, Christendom begins at 312 and ends in the 20th century. Entonces, Cristianidad empieza en 312 y no termina hasta el siglo XX. So, um, Christianity did not become official religion of Rome until 382, so that's way after he died. Pero Cristianismo no fue oficial como religión hasta 382. 382 y eso fue después que murió Constantino. And then in 392 pagan becomes forbidden. Pero en 392 oh. eh, fue prohibido por el pagano. And what's interesting is during this time Christians begin persecuting pagans. Y interesante que los cristianos empiezan a perseguir a los paganos. But that's where we're going to stop this week, next y week. Y ahí es donde vamos a parar para esta semana. Next week, I want to talk about how this 
affected this big change? This is a monumental change within Christianity. How this affected the church? The church uh, was poor, powerless, and persecuted. La iglesia era pobre y sin poder y perseguido. I try to think of my P word. It became <laughs> prosperous, powerful, <laughs> and protected. Pero ya subió a ser prospero, <laughs> protegido, y poderoso. And we're going to talk about what that change meant. And not everybody was in agreement with this. Que vamos a ver qué significó sorry, eso sorry, el cambio. A little too fast. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. Eso sería la semana que How this affected the church. Como afect a la who's, who's, uh, let me close this video and then we'll do uh, conversation. Hasta luego, hasta la See you later. Viene.